You know, growing up, there was this one summer that um, my brother and I, we didn't have that much to do. So we decided we were going to join the Hardin County Boxing Club. And we didn't have a gym. What we had, we had a two-door garage in the neighborhood. We would go over there every day at 4 o'clock to 5.30, and we would learn how to box. And the ultimate goal for a boxer to do is to finish the fight, stand in the middle of the ring, and the referee will grab both of your hands, or the opponent in your hand, and he would raise the winner's hand up. But have you ever thought what kind of fight we're in? I'm talking about the kind of fight that Jesus had after coming off of his 40-day and 40-night fast. And Daniel, after 21 days of prayer. Our fights seem endless because if you take a survey today and you ask all the Christians in America, like President Bush used to say, in America, you ask them, what is it? What's going on in your life? And 90% will say, we're in a fight. Well, what kind of fight are we in? Well, we're in a fight to keep the lights on. We're in a fight for, I hate to say this, but we're in a fight for souls. I mean, it is so easy to sit back and watch everyone else do the hard stuff. Well, after all, what can a little church in Silsby, Texas do for the kingdom of God? Well, if every church in America had that attitude, we'll just let the mega churches do it. We'll let the, the big churches, we'll let the first Baptist and the first assembly and the first whatever, we'll let them pull the heavy load. We'll sit back and we'll support. Well, I don't know about you, but the big churches are overwhelmed and they're in a big fight also. So it's no longer us against them. It's no longer God versus Satan. It's us versus us because we're defeating ourselves. We are so wrapped up into what we think God wants us to do to, to, to settle down, get in his word and find out exactly what we're going through. We are going through a fight. But listen to this. If you go to MD Anderson today, you will see floors and floors and floors of kids that haven't done anything. But yet they're fighting for their life with either cancer, tumors, or what have you. And you got parents that's, that holds their children with cancer and tumors and, and, and everything. And they look at that child and that child hasn't done anything. except was born and tried to live a good life. But in the midst of their fight, we look at the fights that we have every day. We fight to pay our mortgage. We fight for our jobs. These people are fighting for their lives. These moms and dads are fighting just so their kids could have a normal life. Now, I know when we hear cancer and we hear tumor, we, we think there's no hope for them. Except for us Christians, we, we believe in a God that can, can heal them and everything like that. But the harsh reality is, even though that statement's true, there's a lot of death. There's a lot of death. And there's a lot of questions that's being asked of the Christian community. 
well, if your God is so loving, why is this happening? And that's one of the hardest things to answer, except I can say this. My God is still in control. My God still holds his position in heaven. Now, whenever we look in Exodus 17th chapter, we find that Moses and Joshua finds themselves in a fight against a mighty army. And then we find out that, you know, as long as Moses held his hands up high, Israel prevailed. But when he let his arms down, what happened? The Amalite. We go for it. And I often wonder, like a, a fighter, you know, his, his reward is at the end, the referee raising his hands. But why can't we raise our hands during the midst of the battle? Why is it so difficult for us to give God possession of the fight that we're in? Why is it so difficult for us to understand, hey, you know what? If I fight this battle in my own strength and in my own power, I'm going to get defeated. But if I can somehow raise my arms and my hands towards God and let Him take over this battle, and let me praise him while he's doing it. Everything will be okay. I know easier said than done. Let's go ahead and go to Exodus, the seventh chapter, 17th chapter. We're going to start reading with verse 11. We're going to be reading out of the Amplified Bible. I think Matt's going to have that up. Verse 11. Now when Moses held his hands, Israel prevailed. And when he lowered his hands due to fatigue, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and he grew tired. So they took the stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. So it was that his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed and defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. If I can ask you, what's the one battle that you're fighting today? It could be with your children, it could be with your family, it could be with your job, it could be anything. And it doesn't matter to God what it is, except that it matters to you. Because to be frank and honest with you, people don't really care what you're going through. They have their own problems. For a brief time, they will show interest and care. But for the most part, they have their own problems and they want to deal with their problems. God doesn't take that attitude towards us. Each problem that we have is very important to him. Now, with us saying that, we also must agree that God's a very busy God. There's a lot of problems going on. I mean, look at the economy. Look at the presidential race that's coming up. Just look at everything in life. I mean, just the, the grocery store. Matt was telling me that he went and uh, I don't know, spent a couple of three hours at Walmart um, and everything like that. I fight the internet whenever it comes to my groceries. But what we could all come in agreement is that at the end of the day, whether you're at Walmart live or you're online ordering your food, that total comes up. Doesn't matter. And I don't know about you, but I looked at a total the other day, and what I got was unbelievable compared to what I paid for. Now, I know to you women, probably that's no surprise, okay? 
But I am so thankful that I get my eggs from the Dempsey's <laughs> because they're not cheap. Bread's not cheap. And I'm often reminded of the story that, um, you know, where it's going to be uh, in order for you to get bread, you're going to have to have a wheelbarrow full of money and stuff like that. I remember Dad used to talk about that all the time. And even though I understand what they were saying, theoretically, we're in that spot now. Okay? We really are. I mean, and you're not even talking about meat and things like that. Now, what it used to cost to raise a baby for a month, $362, now is probably closer to $675. Now, the, well, I know. <laughs> Sarah's saying. <laughs> and Daddy is saying, yes. Oh. But the reality is we're in a fight that we've never been in before. And I don't want to compare myself to those moms and dads that are fighting with their children at MD Anderson or throughout the hospitals and homes throughout this world. But I do want you to realize that there is a God that is still in control. When things look hopeless, when the fight looks like it cannot be won, God will send a stone for you to sit on and rest. And we'll send someone to hold your left arm. And if you agree, God will also send one to hold your right arm up. And then when you look back and the battle is won, you can say, hey, we defeated them. But it was only through God. Now, we can go through a physical fight and we can come out victorious. But we're in a spiritual battle today. We're in a spiritual battle that only God can fight for us and win for us. Now, we will admit that prayer is our biggest weapon. All right? And if you don't believe me, just look how much time Jesus spent in prayer when he was walking this earth. Well, I can only imagine it was because of the fight that he was in. And he missed his dad. I mean, after all, what is prayer? It's a communication between you and your Heavenly Father. We will spend time talking to someone at our garage to fix our car, and we will go into great detail as to, hey, this is what's wrong with my car. It makes this funny noise. The transmission slips. The air isn't as cold as it needs to be, or it's not as warm as it needs to be. We will go to a doctor a perfectly stranger in our life, and we will tell them the ultimate things that are wrong with us. I got a sore throat. I got an itch. I got a pain. We will tell our doctor and our mechanics, but we won't go to God and give him intimate details about our lives. Maybe because we're embarrassed. Maybe because, you know, we've always heard, he already knows all this. Well, what do you think God and Jesus talked about? Everything. Everything. <coughs> but, yeah, we fight to no end to keep our mouth shut and not tell God everything. God, I'm... I'm addicted to pornography. God, I'm addicted to alcohol. I have a drug problem. My wife and I love each other, but you know what? We can't find that intimacy anymore. I just don't feel happy at work anymore. I mean, is any of those problems I just mentioned greater than the God that we serve? 
I wouldn't have the job I have if it wasn't for God. I wouldn't have the spouse I have if it wasn't for God. So why not include God? The thing about it is we only want to include God in good things. God is a bad dude when it comes to bad things. Every time I read in the Bible, he can always turn something bad into good. And Satan's job, what does he do? He seems to take everything that's good, turns it into bad. Or he takes everything that's semi-good, borderline good, and he seems to keep everybody depressed and oppressed and everything. But you know what? We also have a Satan in our life that everything's rosy. We don't think of Satan that way. But Satan can be a pretty cool devil. And what I mean by that is he doesn't have to do anything bad. As long as he can get you comfortable in the position you're at right now, he doesn't have to kill anyone. He doesn't have to... Um, you know, cause you to lose your job or, or be afraid of losing your job or, or anything. All he has to do is just sit back and let you feel comfortable. Amen. But what do we make God do? Well, God, if you're such a living or loving God, then why are babies dying? Why are people suffering with diseases and cancer and tumor and all this. We'll give God a hard time and want him to explain every little thing that's wrong. We'll give Satan a free pass. Well, after all, if it's bad, it's God's fault. We're in a battle today that we've never been in before. We're in a battle where we don't know what good is, and we don't care. We don't know what evil is, and we don't care. We're just in a fight where we just don't care. Well, Brother Robert, that's not fair to say, and, and that just doesn't make sense. Now, if it made sense, <laughs> if it made sense, Satan would be out of a job. I remember whenever I was boxing, <laughs> and it was so funny, because once you were in it for, I don't know, let's say six months to a year, you would get these other kids, all right, freshly off the street and everything like that, and they would want to street fight, okay? And I also remember, as an adult, I had a guy, let's say Tim size. Tim's a pretty good size guy, all right? He could probably take someone like me and just tear me up physically. Okay, and his experience in the street and his past life would probably even add more to that. But these kids would come out thinking, you know what, I'm bigger, I'm stronger and everything like that. But because of the training that we had after six months or a year, people for street fights that could kick anyone's tail outside of this particular ring would do so. But you get them in the ring, all right, and they were so easy to defeat. Now, as Christians, we can't compete with the street fighters out there. But you get them in our ring and the training that we get from our God, there's no competition anymore. My God is so much more superior. The thing about it is Brother Bill, I mean, look at Brother Bill. 175? No. We're going to say 175, okay? Mm -hmm. 
and an NFL player, wide receiver, running back, whatever. Because of Brother Bill's training, all right, and because of the NFL training, you get them in a, a fight or anything like that, my money is going on Brother Bill because of his training and what he was taught. Even though his opponent is bigger, stronger, and probably faster, Brother Bill could probably take him. We see this all the time, we hear this all the time, but we never, we never really look at it in our Christian life. Okay, when we look at the world, we look at something so big, so fast, so strong. And who are we? Who are we in Silsby, Texas to come to the Goppy House Church and only have so many members and we're fighting this big battle out there? We never look at the training that we received. We have had a community for the last 15 years of this church struggling every day, not once a year, not just at holidays. We're talking about a community that struggles to put food on their tables, to keep money in their pocket, to send kids to school with school clothes and school supplies and have a little snack afterwards and, and a roof over their head and a bed to sleep and everything like that. This is an everyday struggle. So yes, it looks like we're not doing much. It doesn't look like we're reaching very many people. But that blessing box out there does so much. And you know what? It's smaller than Brother Bill. It's smaller than anyone in here. But the impact that it has because of the training that we receive from our Heavenly Father defeats the enemies in so many areas. I'm not saying the kid's going to get rich and fat. I'm just saying that the kids aren't going to go hungry. They're not going to have someone that's not going to have their back because you got Sister Deborah and you got the rest of us that are praying for them. Keith Frazier, big old boy. Big old boy. Decided that he wanted to box me one day on my carport. So he got his son some boxing gloves and he decided that he wanted to fight me with some boxing gloves. Keith Frazier's big. He's strong. And he runs that mouth. He does. He likes to joke. Likes to play around. So we decide we're going to do this. Let's put the boxing gloves on. Let's go to the carport. I said, okay, any blood happens, we stop. That's our safe word, blood. <laughs> you have it, I have it, we stop, okay? So we get out there, <coughs> and he starts hitting. Body hits, no big deal at that point. I realize, okay, my training from whenever I was smaller kind of kicked in. All right. Have you ever seen that show where um, who, Sammy Davis Jr. or Jerry Lee Lewis, they're in a boxing ring with someone bigger and a professional, and they're just running around trying to avoid anything? That's what I did. I'm not too proud to say that. All right. Not too proud to say that because my experience taught me whenever I was fighting in golden gloves and I was in the championship and I had this little Japanese or Chinese guy, I don't even know what he was, but he was small. All right? I wasn't much bigger, but I was smaller than him. All right? And I was favored to win. And in the first round, probably in the first 30 seconds of the first round, he lands the glove right on the tip of my nose. Had all that Vaseline everywhere, but that didn't matter. He made direct contact on my nose. And a little blood squirted out. Not too bad. But the worst thing about it is, is my eyes teared up. 
and it got to the point where I couldn't see anything. So he just went to town on me. And my cockiness and my arrogance and what I thought I could do all by myself just went out the window with a little Chinese or, or Chinese guy just devastating me. We make an impact, people. I know you don't think so. I know you're all the way in West Virginia. I know y'all are in Buna. You're in Kirbyville, and I said Kirbyville, not Buna. All right, I gave you the credit that's dessert. We're in a ring, all right? And it seems like we're just avoiding, and we're running around because everything's bigger and faster and everything. But it got to the point where Keith, because of his size and his strength and his attitude, he got tired. And I hadn't been swinging at the air. I'd just been dancing around. And it got to the point where I was able to land some punches. And I'm not here to say who won or, or lost, but I survived. All right? I survived. I got all my teeth. All right? I didn't have any stitches. I can still walk. I can still run around. I didn't back down. I stayed in the ring. I fought the battle. But because of the training that I had, and I remembered the training that I had, it's the same training that you get, and you seem like you don't get much training when you come to church, but you do. You do. It seems like you may leave this church, and I didn't get anything from the message. He preached the same sermon I've heard other preachers preach a hundred times. I didn't learn anything. But you can't be with God and not learn something. You can't spend time with God and come out empty-handed. But you got to raise those arms. you got to surrender yourself and say, God, I give it to you. You got to get to that point. Because if you stay in that ring, toe to toe, you're going to get beat down. Use the training God gave you. And we've all learned one thing. We learned this right off the bat. You got to spend time with God. Once it. Sunday to Sunday. I'll talk to God all day today. Get with me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and half a day Saturday. I didn't have time for God. I was too busy handling everything on my own. What I didn't realize is I was getting defeated six days of the week. And on the seventh, I was getting victory. But tell me how you do if you get defeated six days and you only get one day of victory. Shouldn't that be the other way around? But on that seventh day, well, we turned it around and everything like that. So now it's six and one. What if that one day you decide, you know what? I'm going to spend it praying for someone else. Amen. I'm a, yeah. Amen, brother. I will even go <coughs> into my community and I will say hi to people. <laughs> Candy's not here today. She's in our community. Where's she at? She's at work. We're not going to condemn her, condemn her for being at work. Why should we? She's making a living. But there's other people in this community that's never seen us, never heard us. They see the blessing box. 
but most of them, they wait till we leave before they come. I'm sure y'all can relate to that. People need help. People want help. But they're embarrassed. And we're not here to embarrass people. But they still need to know that God is in control. Their culverts at home may be bare. Their car may be on empty. Their house note may be new, due this week. Their telephone may be due this week. But God is still in control. But you're talking about we serve a God that we communicate with, that we pray and we talk to. They don't have that. They don't have that peace that comes when you know something's due and you don't have the money or you look in the refrigerator and you don't have the food. They don't have that peace that will come across. God's got this. God will send someone. Something will happen. God will be in control and make this happen. They don't have that. All they see every day Hopelessness. Most of us, some, have nice homes. Well, we all have nice homes. We can go home. We can, if it's cold outside, we can turn the heat on. If it's hot outside, we can turn the air conditioner on. All right. Some of these places don't even have windows. Central air, central heat. <laughs> wow, what is that? What is a hot shower or bath? Well, I only get that once or twice a week. And you know how cruel kids can be. You know how hard and cruel kids will be to each other. That child can't help that he smells. That child can't help so many things. And what does a kid do? They defend themselves. They get in fights. They stand up, they get an attitude, but deep down they're hurting. Yeah. And us adults, and we've been here before because we've had those kids in our church, and whenever they act up, we don't look at the fact that, oh my God, you know what? I don't want that kid here because he fights, he starts trouble. Look where he came from. Yeah, they have propane this week. Next week, they won't. This week, yeah, they got lights on. Next week, they may not. Yeah, this week, because it's the first of the month, they've got food. But visit them the third and the fourth week of the month and see what they're struggling with then. Well, we take for granted a ketchup sandwich or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Oh, my God. That would be a five-course meal for them. This is just down the street. This is just in our community, and it's in everybody's community. It's the one in Buna, it's in Kirbyville, it's in West Virginia, it's everywhere. I guess I'm saying all this to say we're in a fight, all right? We're in a huge fight right now. So we've all got to come together. We've got to come together with one mind and one accord and say, you know what? There's people struggling. There's people that's, 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 that's hungry and thirsty and, 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 and they just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. How 
have you decided if You know, we all know about the mark of the beast, all right, and we all have theories on how it's going to happen and everything like that. But let me just throw you this out, and I'll, 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 I'll close with this. But there's actually, you don't actually have to go and get an injection and, and let them plant it in you anymore. You don't even have to worry about your credit card or anything like that. You can just take a pill. And your body acid will be the battery. It, it will charge it. All right? I'm not saying this is the mark of the beast. I'm just telling you, technology is just so overwhelming now that, you know, we just thought that we will have, you know, something implanted in us or in our forehead or whatever, whatever you believe. All right? There's a lot of theories out there. But I never thought that there would be a pill I could take and that thing would be entering my body and my body acid will keep it charged so the government or whoever can keep track. Endless, endless supply of power. And we were just thinking, you know, the credit card with the little chips and all that, how that can, that can be it and everything like that. And it could very well be. I, I'm not here to argue that. I'm just saying we're in a fight that we've never been in before. We're coming not only from behind and to the right and to the left and up and down. We're surrounded, yes. all right? And I don't know about you, but the training that I have in the past that my mom and dad gave me was only the beginning, all right? We're at a much bigger level now, all right? Amen. And a year from now, you think technology has stopped? No, it keeps growing, and it keeps growing. And the thing about it is, is I don't consider myself smart. I consider myself average. All right. And for me to keep up with the technology that's going on, I can't do it. You can talk to someone that just graduated from MIT last year. And they will say that the technology today is twice as, I don't know how to say this, has doubled since they graduated. That's just in one year. In two years, it'll be four times. Three years, it'll be six. A human brain can't keep up with that. So we're overwhelmed as each day goes by. But what I found out is God's never overwhelmed. Amen. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about accidentally taking a pill and getting that chip. My God is still in control. I said it before they left. I'll say it when they're visiting, and I'll say it way after they leave. God is still in control. The same God in Silsby is the same God in West Virginia. The same God in West Virginia is the same God for those mom and dads having to deal with their sick children at M.D. Anderson. The same God in Silsby is the same God in Kirbyville. So if you want a man, or if you want a woman, or you want a good job, give it to God. Just give it to God. In closing, for the fifth time, Exodus 14, 14 says, The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I got this. This is what God is saying to you. I got this. I know it's overwhelming. I know your bank account is, is running low. I know your pantry is slim. But I got this. 
I know you seem to think that your church isn't doing anything, but as long as I run this church, God, not, not me, God, I got this. That's one of the frustrating things, and I'll say this in front of my sister. That was one of the frustrating things about mom and dad. Sometimes they would look at numbers. And I'll be totally honest with you. As a pastor, it's very easy to go down that road. But then in the quietness of your office, in your prayer closet, driving down the road, planting flowers, working on the floor, God would say, you don't run this church. You don't run this ministry. I do. So whatever you got now, it's because I gave it to you. Be satisfied. Don't gripe. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Don't start any strife. What you got is exactly what I gave you at the time you needed it. Please stand. You know what the favorite part? I knew that Blue was coming. I knew she was coming. Sis told me yesterday that they're in Texas. Now, whether or not I was going to see them this morning in this sanctuary or next week sometimes, I knew that I would see them. And I certainly would have heard from them if I didn't see them. So... I have the best of both words. But my question was, and my question to God was going to be, would she have blue hair? Would she honor me with blue hair so I can continue to call her blue? I don't know about you, but that's the first thing I notice whenever I walk in. You can say it's purple. I'm saying it's blue. It is blue. Okay. See, it's blue. It will always be blue and you will always have that nickname. Jake will always be known as Mr. Blue. <laughs> Sorry. Brother and Sister Blue. Yep. Brother and Sister Blue. I've told people in West Virginia that you call them Mr. Blue. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just something that will always stick. I, I don't get any negative. I get people stopping me all the time, little kids. Absolutely. And Sister Deborah will always be Sister D. Sarah will always be little Sarah. <laughs> Brother D. Brother Bill will always be. And Miss Norma. How do you forget Miss Norma? And let me tell you, Tim was on a roll today. Y'all didn't get it, but me and Sis was up there and we were talking about he's on a roll today. All right. And what I've learned in the last year or so is that Chris will always have a beard. The question is, did he get a haircut or is he letting it grow out? But what I'm saying here is we all have special things that we are known for. All right. I want to be known as someone that let God have control of my life, the ministry, this church. But as I get older, I'm not so much worried about myself as I am my kids, my family, even the people I work with. Because I know whatever I'm going through, I can come home and I can get in that quiet, still place and God will talk to me and I will talk to him. And he will answer me and I will answer him. And I will have a relationship with him and he will have a relationship with me. But my biggest, my biggest fear, concern, whatever you want to call it, is that someone that I know 
will never reach that spot. And I can almost bring tears to you to realize, you know what? I've got something as simple, all, as it, all it takes is just communication. 